On today's episode of the John Campy Show podcast, the Hollywood strikes continue and they're having an impact on other jobs as well as over 17,000 jobs have been lost so far. Also, Disney suddenly, out of nowhere, pulled their channels like ESPN and ABC off of the second largest cable provider service, Spectrum Charter. We'll discuss that also. Ron Perlman still insists he wants to do Hellboy 3 because they always planned it as a trilogy and... That Taylor Swift Eras Tour movie coming out, it's already destroying several major box office records, putting it on par with something like Avengers Endgame. We'll discuss in the whole bunch more. The John Cabot Show podcast starts right now. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the Best Damn Movie Related Show on the planet at the John Campus Show podcast. Coming to you from right here in our quaint little studio, brought to you in part by our friends at Mint Mobile. I am, of course, your host, John Campia, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world. Movies and movie news, TV and streaming and all sorts of good stuff. Not just giving you our opinions, but trying to give you some information and context so you guys can form your own well-informed opinions, whether they're the same or completely different from ours. Uh, joining me in studio over here, we got Ray Ora. Hey, what's up, guys? We got Jonathan Voico. Hello, everybody. The delightful Chris Carr. Hey, y'all. My name's John Campia, and we are so glad you're making this show part of your day, and here's how it's going to go. We're first going to talk about those topics that I just listed off, and then we're going to go and take questions from our YouTube channel members, and we're going to see what they have to say to us. All right. With all that down, let's get into it here with this. It is now day, I want to say, 117 of the writer's strike. Uh, the actor's strike continues to go on, and the industry continues to be ground to a halt, unless you're in Venice at the film festival there. There, everything looks like everything's fully going full speed. Everything looks wonderful. But no, seriously, the the strikes have taken a major toll on the studios, on Hollywood as a whole, on writers, on actors, on, on everybody involved, right? I mean, that's the reality of whenever two sides can't come to an agreement, you get a strike, this happens. But a new report has come out uh, featured in The Hollywood Reporter that is really highlighting the fact that, you know, when stuff like this happens, it never only impacts the immediate parties involved. There is what they call in war collateral damage. Uh, that's unfortunate, something nobody wants, but it, it's part of it, and that's there. And a new report has just come out that has suggested there have been 17,000 jobs lost as a result of the ongoing strikes. Uh, this is some select paragraphs coming from that Hollywood Reporter uh, article says this, the ongoing Writers Guild of America and SAG after strikes are beginning to hit Hollywood's labor pool. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics in figures released Friday, the film, TV and music industry shed over 17,000 jobs last month. Beyond the striking workers, the impact of the strikes has led to layoffs at other businesses in Hollywood, including at production companies, talent agencies, um, and businesses that have traditionally relied on Hollywood studio systems for their income. On Thursday, California State Treasurer Fiona Ma sent a letter to the studios asking them to return to the negotiating table. The impact of these two strikes paralyzes Hollywood and reverberates across the state, affecting countless businesses, thousands of pension funds, beneficiaries, and millions of Californians, Ma wrote. And look, the sexy stuff here is, of course, you know, actors and writers and big Hollywood studios having their disputes and the issues at hand, AI, residuals, uh, writer size rooms, uh, writer room sizes, I should say, and others. But it's important for us to also acknowledge, and I think this article does a pretty good job of it, of as these things go on, the industry as a whole and those industries connected to it are taking a serious beating. There are people who are not writers or actors or studio executives who have jobs relying on production being going and all that kind of stuff. And it's having a direct impact. The numbers also in the article went on to talk about how much money this has probably cost the economy at this point. So it's, it's something that nobody is happy about. The writers aren't happy about it. The studios aren't happy about it. The, the actors aren't right, happy about it, but it's just a consequence of war, uh, I suppose, and it's has an impact. And it's even has like even us around here, like when no nothing is in production and no new deals are being side, uh, signed, 
It's even difficult for us to sometimes, I mean, the last couple of days we have a lot to talk about, but there are some days that there's not a lot to talk about. So even though we're on the way outside orbit of what's going on at the core of this thing, it's even impacting people like us. Anyway, um, Chris, as this thing has progressed and gone on, we get little glimpses of hope and then we get massive dashes of reality to be followed by little glimpses of hope, yeah. massive dashes of thing. I mean, I got really excited the other day just because at least on the writer's side, it looked like the writers and the studios were at least talking again. I mean, that that even if you're yelling at each other, they're at least talking. We finally saw the studios produce a counter offer, which I have no idea why they didn't produce that a week after the strike began, but whatever, here we are. Um, but the unfortunate reality is, is it's having an impact on everybody uh, surrounding that. Do you think that this reality is something that the leadership of the AMPTP, SAG, the WGA, is this something that they're all cognizant of? Do you think that kind of lights a fire into them, understanding that there are people beyond just their immediate conflict? Or is this something that they all were just kind of cognizant of before they even began? And it's just like, it sucks, but that's a casualty of war. I don't know. How do you think it's being looked at? I personally feel, and obviously I have an inherent bias as always as a sag after member. That doesn't mean you're not allowed uh, to have an opinion. But yeah, just always want to preface that when people are like, Chris isn't reporting facts. Of course I'm not. I'm reporting my opinion on the matter. <laughs> I'm not a journalist either. So that was very professional. <laughs> I think that SAG after members and I think WGA member, GA members were very cognizant of this from the beginning of, yes, this affects everybody. And that solidarity we've also seen with other guilds and other uh, unions, IATSE, everyone like that too, knowing that this shuts down the industry for all of us and it's going to affect all of us. And I do think that definitely puts a fire under all of us to get things solved. But if the AMPTP isn't going to counter with anything that actually is meaningful, then there's not much to do here. The AMPTP, however, I do think they have had more of a, well, of course this affects all of these workers, but we don't want to give them that 1%, 2% raise. It does seem very Ebenezer Scroogey right now of, but I want to dive in my money vault and I couldn't give any of you peasants anything. <laughs> it feels like that. It feels like cartoon mustache twirling mm. greed nonsense. There was a great op-ed piece in the LA Times yesterday from Mary McNamara talking about how the MPTP really just needs to come to terms with, hey, look, you've hired all these PR firms. You're doing all this crisis management. You are spending so much more money than this should cost you by just giving in to a few things. And you're already the public villains. In a Gallup poll, 67% of Americans are on the side of strikes and unions as a whole. Now, that isn't a huge majority, but still, public opinion is going to the side of writers and actors and everything as well. This is also going to continue to affect everyone on a state level, too. Now, there's already precedence for this in states like New York and New Jersey, but unionized workers, when on strike, can qualify for unemployment. And a bill is being brought forward here in California to do the same. So... If you're a Californian and you maybe aren't really keen on the actors or anything striking to begin with, your taxes could still be affected by our work. Restaurants are affected by this. Um, insurance companies are affected by this. Car rental places, all kinds of businesses here are affected at every level because of Hollywood shutting down. So something has to happen here because it's not just that the Bobs and everyone aren't making their money and we're not you know, having new content. It's that no one's making money and that's going to affect us on such a huge level we've got a really great important economy that needs to be looked at should things continue like this let me ask you this and because i i'm asking jimmy because i don't know what the answer to this mm -hmm. is so like somebody like me and i for one am super grateful that you're actually a part of SAG because you get to give us that perspective let me ask you this though like from a writer's perspective like a couple of weeks ago the details of the AMPTP's offer to the WGA was made public. To outsiders, I'm not in the WGA, I'm not in the AMPTP. To some outsiders like myself, that deal looked pretty good. Um, we haven't seen, have you heard, I'm, I haven't heard, this is the, a legitimate question, I don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. Have we heard, has the WGA countered again or has the WGA kind of just dug in their heels and said, nope, this is what we want and we're not compromising? I'm I mean honestly not sure if they made a counter offer. I do know the AMTP released a statement during what was supposed to be a media blackout that both sides agreed to. Right. Which is not a great look. 
It's not really. But really I mean, to good. be fair, to mm-hmm. be fair, and God damn it, I hate it when I have to say something on behalf of like studios. Mm-hmm. But to be fair, like people in the WGA constantly are in front of the microphone and they're constantly vilifying the AMPTP and they're constantly saying all this stuff. I don't know how it's unfair for the, you know, AMPTP to say, look world, we did make them an offer and here's what it was. I don't know how that's unfair where it's completely fair that the WGA members can, or, or the leadership can constantly just talk about how evil and violent that we, without giving specifics and without giving actual numbers, just saying we're not being given enough. We're not being given this. Like I, I think it's perfectly fair for the WGA to do that. I just don't see why it con- should be considered foul sure. play for the I, studios to do that as well. I think the bigger issue was that it was a a public statement being presented to the press, w- press with things when it was, hey, we're going to all sit down for a minute and cool off and talk about this. Mm. I think that was more of, a, mm. of the MTP going, yeah, yeah, of course, but we're going to jump ahead of this and try to get ahead of it. That's the part that's a little ick, for lack of a more uh, professional term there. You know, maybe they are countering with something worthwhile. Maybe they didn't. I'm not sure. Really right now, though, all, all I keep coming back to is, look, we've done this song and dance before. We have of the writer's strike in, what, 2007? And how that hugely affected the industry. Yeah. Not only at the time, but moving forward. I mean, that oh, no. was- Part of the landscape, you pointed this out before, yeah. and I think you're right, part of the landscape today is still a repercussion. It's because of, of that. that we started strike. keeping up with the Kardashians because of this. Ah! So the AMPTP needs to make meaningful changes to their offers. And also, I do know one thing that was an issue was that there were so many things that just felt ambiguous in their counter offer mm. that still felt like there's too much wiggle room for you guys to dick us around here. Again, probably said in a more legalese manner than I am presenting to everyone here. But there's just too much gray area in some of these counter offers. And I think they all need to come to terms. Again, it's not going to be a number that everyone's happy with, but they need some more concrete details on this because contracts, when you have loopholes, people find them that is just oh, the nature of them. it yeah 100%. exactly if you have and a loophole not in that it, studios would ever do that never not even one time <laughs> right we, we kind of saw this with the nun story we covered a few weeks ago mm-hmm. of just yeah no we're giving you a portion of this but what if we don't have to give you a portion of this so, you know it, it's always if there's a gray area people are going to exploit it so i think that's one of the issues right now is they need concrete solutions on that contract you know what i would love as again as an outsider looking in mm-hmm. i would love for both sides to shut up and li- and, and and stop being ambiguous because like AMPTP putting some ambiguity in the offer itself, but also the WGA speak in ambiguities. I would love for both sides to put forward specifics of what they're asking for. Like I, I get when I hear the WGA leadership, like we're looking for more equity in this. Okay, no, but tell me specifically, we want 3.2% of this. Stop speaking in generality. Say exactly what it is you're looking for so you can take the AMPTP's feet, put them to the fire, and have the AMPTP actually address the specific numbers that what it is that the, the WGA is looking for. And and then just keep going back and forth and keep talking until you get to a number that I like the way you said it, that you're both a little bit unhappy with and say, okay, you know, it, it, I brought this up before this part still, I was I had this conversation with a friend of mine who's in one of the unions yesterday. And this part still really bothers me. These deals are only for three years. They're only for three years. And I don't understand why the AMPTP can't say take Maybe there's three things they find completely unacceptable. Take one of them and say, you know what? We'll, whatever, we'll give you that one. But we all understand in three years, we've got three years to keep talking about it because in three years, we're going to want to revisit this. And let's keep talking over the next three years. I don't know why the WGA doesn't go, okay, here's the two things we find unacceptable. Fine, we'll eat it on one with a complete understanding that we got to revisit this in three years. Or why don't both sides get together and say, look, we're close on this, this, and this. We're pretty far apart on this, this, and this. Why don't we come to this agreement and we'll make an agreement, screw the three years. We'll make it a temporary one-year deal. And over this next 12 months, we're not going to take a 10-month break and then start talking again 60 days before the deadline. Let's take the whole bloody year and keep talking. And I, I don't know, it just seems like 
nobody seems desperate, not the studios. Nobody seems desperate to get everybody back to work right now. And as an outsider, they're starting to drive me a little bit crazy, especially when we're hearing that they're not talking to each other. It's, yeah, I don't know. I just, I, I don't know why some common sense can't be brought in here and just say, look, let's, let's, let's come up with something that gets everybody back to work right now and gives us a mechanism to continue hammering out our issues without being committed to it long term. There's got to be some, I mean, I, I'm probably way oversimplifying it. I, I probably am, but it just, it seems to me like there's got to be something there to allow something like that to happen. But anyway, okay, guys, with that down, let's move on to this. Ah, uh, no, who, no, let's not. Let's stay on conflict. <laughs> because if you are a subscriber, one of the like 14, 15, 16 million American subscribers to the Charter Spectrum cable network. And you were, say, watching the US Open the other day on ESPN, and then all of a sudden your TV went blank, you weren't alone. Because suddenly, Disney pulled all their networks, ESPN, FX, ABC, all that kind of stuff, poof, in the middle of some sporting events going on, pulled them off Spectrum because they're having a carriage, uh, a carriage dispute right now. They can't come to terms. The 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 term of their existing deal broke down and the networks just disappeared off of uh, charter. Is that a good move for Disney right now? Considering there's a WGA and an actor strike going on. That is the topic of today's mint mobile hotline question of the day. If you guys got a question, would like to hear your voice on our show. Go ahead and call it anytime 24 seven at nine, five, one, two, six, eight, four, two, five, nine. We pick one or two questions every day. And today's is again about disappearing networks. Check it out. Hey, John Cruz, this is Michael calling from Santa Clarita, California. You know, I was just on my Spectrum programming, and I noticed that Disney has pulled their programming from the Spectrum network. This is freaking ridiculous, considering that they have all the problems with the strikes and everything. Do you think this will get settled soon? What do you think? Thanks for everything. Bye. All right, thanks a lot for calling that in. You know, we, we did a short video about this earlier today on our YouTube channel. For those of you listening to the podcast, we also have a YouTube channel that we run some short videos on. But at any rate, this is nothing new. If this sounds a little bit of a matrixy deja vu-ish, it's, it's because it is. These things happen, and it's happened to Disney quite a bit in the last little while. But, you know, according to the Hollywood Reporter here, basically what happened was that we had... People watching Spectrum. Let's bring up that uh, that image there. Uh, people were watching TV. They were watching college football. They're watching the U.S. Open, and all of a sudden, poof, networks disappeared. In essence, here's what happened. Disney said, we're going on strike, uh, at least as far as their television networks go. We're going on strike. We don't like the terms that we're having here right now with Charter and Spectrum. We haven't come to an agreement. And instead of just carrying on with an agree with an arrangement that we don't think works for us, we're pulling our stuff off of Charter Spectrum until we're able to reach an agreement. Now, of course, isn't everything. There are two sides to this, but we'll start with Disney giving kind of their perspective. Disney released the following statement. They said, we've been in ongoing negotiations with Charter Communications for some time and have not yet agreed to a new market-based agreement. Disney said in a statement Thursday, acknowledging the blackout. Disney Entertainment has successful deals in place with pay TV providers of all types and sizes across the country, and the rates and terms we were seeking in this renewal are driven by the marketplace. We are committed to reaching a mutually agreed upon resolution with Charter, and we urge them to work with us to minimize the disruption to their customers. So that's their kind of thing. They say, look, we've got tons of deals with lots of providers, and we've got healthy deals with everybody. And what we're asking for is what we determine to be market value for what our content brings. That's what we want. Now, Charter, well, obviously, well, they've got a, another side to it. They're like, listen, we can't just have a system where costs and expenses continue to rise and rise because obviously Disney wants more. We can't have that system plus the bundling system with cable. Like, you got to subscribe to a package that may have five different channels you don't even want. But Disney wants those bundles because that works for them doesn't work for charter. So you've got a system here where you got two sides trying to figure out the best deal that works for each of them. Now, again, if you've got a little bit of deja vu, because Disney has had these sort of carrier disputes twice in the last couple of years. Uh, check this out. Disney has found itself in a handful of carriage disputes over the past two years. Last October, 
Disney's channels, including ESPN and ABC, went dark on the satellite TV service Dish Network and its Sling TV, which is pretty popular, its Sling TV streaming offering in a similar dispute. The channels were offline for a couple of days before the companies reached a deal. And in late 2021, Disney's channels went dark on YouTube TV. I remember this because I'm a YouTube TV subscriber myself, but also returned after a deal was reached in a couple of days. So this has happened. Apparently, they were able to get things resolved fairly quickly. Um, I kind of suspect we're going to see this resolved a little more quickly as well, but there is a growing difference. So even though these things were just like a year or two ago, I think there's a bigger thing happening here as well, which is Disney is already as a whole, Disney as a whole is already very much in the process of preparing for the post cable world. A lot of the moves, a lot of the realignments as they've done lately have clearly been in preparation to be a complete post cable world. Now, there's still a lot of cable subscribers and still a lot of money. We did a story recently, Chris, where we talked about how for the first time ever, less than 50% it was the first time ever in history that less than 50% of TV usage in the United States was like 49.2, less than 50% was actually for watching cable TV. Mm -hmm. And that trend is not about to reverse. It's not going anywhere. So you have Disney on the one hand saying, you know, we can get better and better terms because we're moving away from cable. So to be there, we, we are going to need better and better terms. Whereas you're going to have the cable companies like a spectrum going, look, they're aware of cable is becoming an antiquated. They, they're aware of that. Yeah. So they're like, we need to have the best deals we can right now because of, of the reality of the struggling. So that could make this one last more than just the couple of days, like the dish TV one and the YouTube TV one, because it's a little bit more of a solid reality now. I still don't expect this to last very long. I think probably Charter and Spectrum customers are going to get these back on, I'm going to guess in a week or two, maybe not in a day or two, but probably a week or two. What do you think about this one? I had to do some extra research on this because I don't have cable. And so I, was, I haven't had for like 10 years. What's happening with this? Um, but the, the statements from Charter have been, Oh, really well done here, too, of just putting all of this on Disney. Um, I was reading in Yahoo Finance, uh, the conflict stems from Charter alleging Disney has uh, insisted on rates higher and limited flexibility, arguing that the g media giant would lead to unsustainable price hikes for consumers that would force users to pay for channels they might want, uh, not want and can't afford and would require customers to pay twice to get content apps with linear video that they've already paid for. So all of it is vilifying Disney. <laughs> Well done, Charter PR. <laughs> because when you read that statement, you go, well, I don't want to do any of that. Of course not. How dare Disney try to make me do this when they have their own subscription plans and everything, too? Uh. Um, it's also made both companies' stock dive about like 3%, which I know isn't wildly significant. But to happen because of something blipping out like that that quickly, I think that's something to be looking at. I do think they'll probably come to terms with each other fairly quickly just because that's not something that you can really let hang in the balance of just, well, that's just not going to exist on our channel right now or on our services right now. So hopefully they can come to some kind of an agreement, but Disney, you guys, you're having a kind of rough few weeks here. <laughs> you guys need to, it's a good thing you hired that big DCPR firm because some of the damage control needs to kick up. See, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think they need damage control in this really? one. This is, this is market. This is like, look, We've been able, we've got at least two dozen other carrier partners that we have, and we've been able to reach acceptable deals with all of them, except mm. you. You're the only ones. And what we're asking for is market value. That's all we're asking for. We're asking for market value, which has been proved out by all the other deals we've had with the other carriers. Now, that being said, one of the reasons I canceled cable was because the damn bundling packages. Yep. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I dumped it years ago. But if you're a company like Disney, and look, Rob always says, you don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. I don't fault anybody anytime trying to negotiate what is in their best interests. You know, I that, that's fine. That's what everybody should do. Because if you're not going to represent yourself, nobody else is going to represent for you. I get that Disney, these package deals, and by the way, Disney's not the only one who does these. Uh, they're a prominent one, but not they're not the only one. But these package sort of deals is in their best interest. 
And especially when they're looking at a medium that they have less and less interest in. It's like, well, for us to be here, we got to have this. And of course, the two sides are going to vilify each other. But here's what's going to happen. In a world where, I mean, I used to be rare about being a cable cutter. Like, you know, there wasn't a lot of us when I became a cable cutter. There are a lot of cable cutters now. Oh, yeah. And the number of cable cutters is getting quicker. And here's the thing that Disney knows and that Comcast knows. For all those millions of people who are on the fence about cutting cable, oh, I don't have ESPN on Charter now. I can't watch my college football, which in the United States is a massive, massive thing because ABC's in there too and all that kind of stuff. I think Charter knows that they can't afford this. They, in a business where people are, are kind of getting on their wagons and leaving as fast as they can, to give people more reason to leave is going to be something they can't, they simply can't do. And in, in, in an industry that is simply disappearing, like, look, I know what I'm saying isn't fair. I know what I'm saying isn't fair. It ain't my job to say what's fair. My job is to say it the way it is. And I don't know that anybody disagrees that that's the way it is. And Disney recognizes that. And the other providers that are going to be dealing with these carriers recognize that. It's like, look, if you're going to hang on for the next 10 years, you're going to have to have this, 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 and this, and this, if you want to at least last. And I don't even know that they can last 10 more years. But it's going to be... Um, it's I, this, this is why I think this will be resolved quickly. I think very quietly behind the scenes, they're going to, they're going to, I don't think either side is going to move far off their position. I think they'll get like not halfway to each other, but maybe 5% of the way to each other. And then they'll just say, fuck it. We got to sign this. And then they're both going to put up this. Cause this is what happened with direct TV. And this is what happened with YouTube TV. They're going to put out a statement. That's a totally kumbaya sort of, we were so we pleased we were able agreement. to together reach this agreement <laughs> to offer great value to our customers and we were able to do get the proper market value they're going saying how about a holiday everybody loves each other and everything's great and of course behind the scenes they're like stabby stabby but i mean that's okay as long as they put on a brave face so i'm giving this 10 days i think a little bit longer than the direct tv one a little bit longer than the youtube tv one but i'm going to give this one 10 days max now this video is going to age very badly if we're on month four of this thing. <laughs> and those clips are going to be playing of me saying, 10 days max. <laughs> oh, well, it's happened. We'll see. All right. Listen, guys, we still got to talk about Ron Perlman and Hellboy. We still got to talk about, out of nowhere, Taylor Swift is destroying box office records. Uh, that and a few other things. But before we do, we're going to take a quick second here and thank a couple of sponsors of today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast. Our friends at Marine Lair and DraftKings. Guys, we want to take a second to thank the sponsor of today's video, Marine Lair. All of us as guys are always looking for shirts that look good, but more importantly, are comfortable. Now, I want you to imagine the softest thing you've ever worn, and that's Marine Lair. Marine Lair is the go-to brand for great fitting and stylish closet staples. Based out of California, where we are, Marine Lair clothes are that perfect mix of laid back style that also looks and feels premium. And these t-shirts stay soft no matter how many times you wash them. It's time to invest in a wardrobe that will actually last. For a limited time, our listeners and viewers get an exclusive 15% off discount with the code CAMPIA at marinelair.com. Like many of you guys, when I looked at Marine Lair's website, I could tell how good their clothes looked. But it wasn't until I got my hands on them and actually put them on that I knew just how unbelievably comfortable they are, which for me is the most important thing. And guys, how many times have you felt that you were in between sizes when buying clothes? What's cool about Marine Lair is that they have in between sizes. You finally no longer have to make that difficult choice between medium and large and extra large. I think we can all admit that the perfect tee is hard to find, but look no further than Marine Lair. For a limited time, get 15% off with the code CAMPIA at MarineLair.com. That's CAMPIA for 15% off your entire order at MarineLair.com. Saving your closet one shirt at a time. We want to thank a sponsor of this video, DraftKings. 
College football fans, are you ready for week one? DraftKings Sportsbook is hooking you up with a can't-miss offer to start the season strong. This week, new customers can bet just $5 on college football and score $200 in bonus bets instantly. Anything can happen in college football. Your team could go from unranked to dynasty mode in just a couple of years because change comes fast. The only thing that's a lock is the great offers from DraftKings Sportsbook. Life's more fun when you're in on the action. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use the code CAN. New customers can score $200 in bonus bets instantly when they bet just $5 on college football. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code CAMPIA. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-H-O-P-E-N-Y or text H-O-P-E-N-Y 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, Kansas, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. See dkng.co slash football for eligibility, terms, and responsible gaming resources. Bonus bets expire seven days after issuance. Eligibility and deposit restrictions apply. And thank you to our friends at Marine Lair and DraftKings for sponsoring this episode of the John Campus Show podcast. All right, guys, with that down, let's move on to this, shall we? You know, I find most people who are fans of genre, most people have a soft spot in their heart for the Guillermo del Toro, Ron Perlman, Hellboy movies. Uh, not the David Harbour one. Uh, which, by the way, no fault on David Harbour. He did the best he could. That movie was terrible. But the Ron Perlman Hellboy movies have a real solid spot, have a really solid crowd following. Unfortunately, they never had a big following when it came to box office. Uh, Ray, can you look up for me the, the box office totals? I meant to look this up earlier. The box office to totals for the first Ron Perlman, Guillermo del Toro, Hellboy, and Hellboy 2. I think it was called The Golden Army. I think that was it. So many memes went around Hellboy called Hellboy won. the Golden Shower. But the first one was 99 million worldwide. And then the Golden Army was 168. Yeah. Hor I mean, let's 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 call it what it is. Those that, those are horrible numbers. Those are not sustainable numbers. And one of the big reasons why, even though those movies are beloved by those few of us who've seen them, they never got a third one is because Guillermo del Toro even just acknowledged there's no way the studio can make money if we make it. Because I need two hundred million dollars to make the third one the way I want. Remember that? That interview Guillermo del Toro did? Well, the Toro said straight up, I would need two hundred million dollars to make the Hellboy three that I want to make. And you haven't even had, I mean, barely the first two movies box office combined barely goes over that number. And so it was just never going to happen. And hence it never did. And then they tried rebooting it and the reboot was a bit of a failure. But listen, a lot of fans keep talking about it and not just fans. Ron Perlman keeps talking about it. He has never wavered that he really wants to do one. And he's kind of ramped it up a bit saying, look, this was always meant to be a trilogy. Uh, this comes to us from the folks over at CBR. Quoting Ron Perlman, he said this, If we were to make the third movie of the trilogy, I would love to do that. Yeah, Perlman said, noting how it would have been a continuation of his prior two films rather than another reboot. It was meant to be three movies. So I would go back and do it if we could finish the trilogy. But those are the only circumstances. Uh, so the one circumstance is, can't be a reboot that I'm coming back for. It has to be the third film. And the other one that's not mentioned in that paragraph is that it's got to be a Guillermo del Toro directing. So you get Guillermo del Toro directing. You get us to do the third and complete this trilogy. I am there because we always wanted it to be three. Now, I can't remember. When did that first Hellboy come out? Did we see 99? 2004. Yeah, 2004. Four. Okay, so it's the first Hellboy was 2004? Yeah. yeah. And then okay, so it's going to be turn 20 next year. Mm -hmm. That's, oh my God, that's, that movie's turning 20. Okay, anyway. Let me just re reshuffle my mental state here for a second. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, Ron Perlman has not gotten younger. I don't know if you know that. Um, and I can't remember. what. Look up Ron's, uh, Ron's age right now. He's 73. He's 73. And he himself has talked in the last year or two about how much he would love to do Hellboy, and he wants to do it, but... He says he gets gets some cold sweats sometimes thinking about what he would have to do physically in order to do Hellboy the way he would like to do it. And that's a big part of it too. But again, that aside, I would love to see Guillermo del Toro and Ron Perlman's third Hellboy film. But from a business point of view, I just don't know how you go into any studio and make a compelling case for how this would be a good investment. 
because Del Toro has been pretty firm. If he's going to do a third one, he wants to do it right. And for him, right means a $200 million budget. You're then probably talking, you're talking about a movie that would need to make probably $500 million to break even. And the first two Hellboys combined didn't even make half of that. So I would love it. I love Ron Perlman. I actually love him even more as a, you know, leader of the Sons of Anarchy. That's just me. But I would love to see him back in this. I just don't see how you convince anybody to do this. Chris, you're a studio exec. Ooh. And pay the actors, pay the writers. <laughs> money, and money. I come in trying to pitch to you the idea of doing a Hellboy 3. Is there anything that I would be able to do that would convince you to sign off on such a thing? Like, like what would you need to see or hear? Or is it just simply an impossible feat? I mean, I say this as somebody who really enjoys Hellboy. <laughs> And I love Ron Perlman because that's he's 73, but he's not he's not a muggle 73. You know what I mean? No, like, he does the voice narration, too, of the UFCs now. Yeah. And he's really good at it. He's fantastic. He does wonderful voice work. He's an incredible actor. And a lot of this would be done by a stunt performer. He would be in the makeup and everything. But I would need such a compelling story. I would need Guillermo. I would need to have Ron on board. And I would need to make sure that the public still has any interest in this franchise mm. because I even if you love the Ron Perlman ones, and I know the second one also didn't get the the most love. Um, I had some issues with it too. After the David Harbour one, and I love David Harbour, he tried so hard to do so much with what he was given, which was not a lot, and it was a CGI nightmare. I'd need to know that people haven't been kind of, you know, turned off by this franchise or this IP at the very least, because it hasn't made money. You know and how much money that David Harbour made worldwide? Negative. <laughs> <laughs> Negative. Wow. Negative money. Not not far. Fifty five million worldwide. Oof, 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 oof. And and the thing is too, the the thing that I love so much about that first Hellboy movie is what makes it so expensive. All these practical effects. Yeah. All that makeup. All that wonderful Doug Jones work. Mm. You know. And and that's what I would be sold on. But it's so cost prohibitive. So. I don't know if you could greenlight something like this without huge public interest or so much, I don't know, funding going into it from the get-go from other people. I mean, it's just a money pit. Speaking of Doug Jones, you see the newest episode of What We Do in the Shadows? No. Oh, I'm Doug behind. Jones returns. Oh, good. Okay. Doug Jones returns in the newest episode. Anyway. <laughs> He's oh. so talented and so nice. He's oh, so sweet. So good. I mean, they... I wish they had allowed him to keep his voice as Abe Sapien. Don't get me wrong. Uh, Niles from Frasier did a very, very good voice. Very, very good voice for Abe. But I think Doug Jones could have done it justice. He was Absolutely. the man in the suit. <laughs> anyway, guys, what do you think? Is I just don't see any reality in which this could actually happen. I, I don't know. Do you guys think there is? Why don't you jump into the comments and let us know. I just forgot about the end of Hellboy 2 as well. If we had the third one, then we'd have to have Liz and Hellboy have kids. Oh, oh my. Like well, it depends but, on which direction he I mean, yeah, and they, would want to go yeah, in. Yeah, but still. Mm. All right. I love that. With that down, guys, let's talk about this, shall we? And I know a lot of our audience doesn't really care a lot about Taylor Swift. I get that. That's fine. But you got to put that aside for a second and you got to wrap your heads around history is being made right here, right now. There's never been anything like, like this. Okay, so for those of you who might be behind a little bit, yesterday, out of nowhere, they announced that Taylor Swift's Eras Tour is going to be converted and has been converted into a concert movie and that on October 13th, they're releasing it in theaters. And it's, uh, they filmed the Los Angeles one, or one of the Los Angeles ones that was done at SoFi Stadium just a few weeks ago. And October 13th, it's coming. They bypassed all the studios. They financed it themselves. They're the main distributors of record themselves. And they're working with AMC Theaters as their distribution arm in this bypassing all the major Hollywood distributors, all the major Hollywood studios themselves. And we opened up ticket sales websites and Chris, you weren't here for this, but 
we were going oh no you were you were here we started going through the amc app and we started looking at all the theaters and that sold out sold out sold out front row only sold out handicap seats only sold out front two rows only like it was nuts uh, listen to this. This is from Variety. They wrote this. Separately, the ticket service... Now, we're going to talk about AMC in a second here. But right now, we're going to talk about Fandango and listen to what they are comparing the sales numbers of this to. The ticketing service Fandango reported that the Eras Tour has broken its record for the biggest first-day ticket sales for 2023, outdoing Barbie, outdoing Mario Brothers, outdoing everything. Without giving specific numbers, Fandango says that pre-sales rank amongst Avengers Endgame, Star Wars The Force Awakens, and Spider-Man Spider No Way Home at similar points in the cycle. Now, the main theater carrying the Taylor Swift Eras Tour is AMC Theaters, and they reported that this Taylor Swift movie has absolutely violated... <laughs> the current existing all-time one-day ticket sales record. The current holder of the all-time one-day ticket sales record was Spider-Man No Way Home for AMC Theaters. That sold $16.9 million in tickets on its first day of tickets being available. That was AMC's all-time record. Taylor Swift just bitch-slapped that record. Broke it by nearly $10 million, selling $26 million worth of tickets in the first day. Sorry, Variety specified. They sold $26 million in tickets in the first three hours. In the first three hours. All-time record, $16.9 million. Taylor Swift just sold $26 million in the first three hours. We got a month and a half before this movie hits theaters. We got a month and a half for more and more screens being added, more and more of the Swifties getting out there and buying their tickets. Chris, my first reaction when the news broke, we did a video about it within the hour of it coming out. And I told everybody, I said, you are naive if you don't think this is going to sell a lot of tickets. Mm -hmm. But I also said, now don't get me wrong, this isn't going to like have a $75 million opening or anything, but it's going to sell a lot of tickets. Oh no, I was wrong. This thing's going to blow past the hundred million dollar mark. I, I'm willing to put some money that this is going to be the biggest opening weekend of the year. I think the current holder is Barbie at like 163 million opening weekend. 68. 168. Yeah. Thank you. $168 million opening weekend. This is not going to have as wide a release. And it's, I think it's going to break that record. I mean, Variety is saying it could break a hundred million oh, opening weekend. Sorry, 62. 162. Excuse me. Okay. Excuse me. I was still off. I was off by, by one. I, the Variety is saying this could break a hundred million. I, I, I don't think they understand. This is what happens in movie theaters. Theaters get sold out. They look at their other theaters, say what's not selling. Okay. We're going to take out that screening of that movie and put another Taylor Swift screening in that screen. And then we're, they've done this before with Marvel films. They've done it before with Star films. Believe me, they'll do it with Taylor Swift. And look, when you got Fandango, who is not even the primary ticket seller of this, saying this thing is on the level of Avengers Endgame and Star Wars The Force Awakens in terms of initial ticket sales. When AMC is saying, oh yeah, our one-day ticket sales were record, just demolished like it was nothing. $26 million. Chris, listen. Again, I want to encourage our listeners and our viewers. Put aside whatever it is you think of Taylor Swift. That's irrelevant. This is some Hollywood history kind of stuff that we're talking about. Like these, these are numbers that are confounding. And don't underestimate just how big this thing could end up being. Anyway, Chris, you a whole a bunch of numbers, whole bunch of facts coming out here, records falling. What is standing out to you the most in this as you're looking at this? The three hours. <laughs> That's how long it took Gilligan to get lost. Look what she did. That's how long it took oh my Gilligan god. To get lost. She's doing amazing stuff. I mean, she's the top grossing artist in the world. The Eras Tour has made a billion dollars. 
Her tour is in the Billion Dollar Club. They say by the time the tour is done, it's going to make $2 billion. Yeah. The biggest tour in the history of music. So for this film to have this kind of opening, I mean... Of course it does, because look at how people just flock to her shows. And not everyone could. I already got my ticket to this movie. It's for my friend's yeah. birthday. Hell yeah, <laughs> Tiffany. We're going to be in row F having the most fun time. It's going to be great. The red one. The red um, the red dot. That's, that's Chris that's right there. Chris. <laughs> but I think you just think of all the people who couldn't afford to get to this show. And now, for a mere 20 bucks, mm -hmm. you get to have the Taylor Swift concert experience with your buddies. Again, it goes back to the Barbie phenomenon. This is going to feel like an event. This is going to be a big to-do. Theaters are capitalizing on it with their, you know, custom collectible buckets of popcorn and their cups for drinks and everything. There's going to be merch for you at the movie theater for this concert. Movie theater owners know that this is going to be huge. Taylor Swift knows this is going to be huge. And all she had to do was do a quick little Instagram post. Hey, friends, you can go see the Eras Tour now. Go get your tickets. Bye. I'm actually going to print some Taylor Swift shirts, and I'm going to stand in front <laughs> of the theater. Sell them and I'm going to sell them like it's our actual concert. Honestly, Ray, be... you would make bank. <laughs> this is a great idea. And here's the other neat thing. I was reading The Hollywood Reporter. The studios are pissed. Oh, I'm sure. And here's why. And you know what? Good. Because they're really upset that... It's considered fair play that when a big movie is going to set a release date that they give other distributors the heads up so they can see what they're going to do with their films and what dates are around there. It's also considered, you know, fair play to let the other studios know all this kind of stuff. AMC as an exhibitor never told the distributors this was coming. They never told the distributors this was coming. But you know what? Fuck them. Because... They didn't give AMC a heads up when Warner Brothers decided we're going to take all our movies and put them on HBO Max day and date. They never told AMC in advance. When Universal was putting out Trolls 2 and they decided to pull it from theatrical release and just put it up on streaming, they never gave AMC a heads up. They never did that. Now, look, it, it hurts my anus a little bit to say anything defending AMC theaters because you guys kind of know how I feel about them. But the reality is... The past five years, all the distributors in the studios have been bending AMC over and fucking them properly. And for AMC to go, yeah, we didn't give you a heads up. Boo hoo. Suck it up. I, I'm glad they're doing it. I honestly am. I'm it, really glad they did it. It matches this way. up with what she's doing with her music right now. Yeah. All of the Taylor's versions. That's so she can actually own her own music, yeah. which is wild that artists don't own their own music. But her doing this independently is just yes anding what she's already doing with her own career so far of taking ownership of all of it, of doing things independently and doing things on her own terms. And, and again, if you don't like her, you got to respect that business acumen. Uh, and speaking of doing things on her own terms, it's also breaking what is normal operating procedure in the theaters. The movie theaters usually set the ticket prices, right? Then they'll have matinee prices, then they'll have whatever. Taylor Swift, who is completely owns this entire movie endeavor, has been able to dictate terms. What would we say the final price was? $19.20? No, it was 1984, 1989 for adults and 13, 13 okay. for kids. So it's Taylor Swift has been able to mandate to the movie theaters. This is something that distributors can't do. But she's been able to mandate to all the theaters, all tickets are $19.89. Like unless the title of her album. Unless yeah. it's... No, that, that title was yeah. on purpose. Wait, what? That's the title yeah. of her album? 1989 it was, was on one purpose. of her albums. Yeah. 1989 was on, was on purpose. I suddenly yeah. love it. I suddenly think yeah. that's awesome. So yeah. I, I don't know what 1313 has to do. Maybe she likes that number, but that I think was... I 13 is her favorite number. Okay, so that was hers for the kids. Wow. For, for kids, right. So, so all movie theaters, you want to carry this, great, but you're all paying, like you're all charging this. And this is why, because somebody wrote in yesterday asking... Wait, I was going to get a ticket, but I but they said I can't use my AMC A list. The reason you can't use your AMC A list, or if you're a Regal uh, Unlimited subscriber, the reason you can't use your Regal Unlimited is because here's what happens: when you use your A list to get a movie ticket, what the movie studio does is, in terms of accounting, they count that as a ten dollar, it's ten or eleven bucks, whatever. We'll just say ten for argument's sake. They count that as a ten dollar movie ticket purchase, and then they uh, remit money back to the distributors and the payment based on a $10 movie ticket purchase sale. Taylor Swift has said, no, you can't do that. 
all the tickets sold are $19.89. So you cannot apply your theater uh, loyalty programs. This is a special thing. This is the thing I'm in control of, and we're doing it this way. And Chris, you're right. All it took was for this girl to get on Twitter or Instagram, put on one Instagram post. Say, hey guys, I got this thing. And AMC, I couldn't get, remember guys, I was trying to get my AMC website to open. I couldn't even get the AMC website to open. Um, the app seemed to be working, but I couldn't get the website open. Uh, again, $26 <laughs> million dollars for AMC theaters alone in the first three hours when their previous record was Spider-Man No Way Home, a movie that made almost $2 billion at the box office, only managed to make 16.9. And we still got a month and a half. And I want to keep the, I want everybody to remember this too. Spider-Man No Way Home, everybody knew this movie was coming for a year. The buzz was building and building and building. And then they announced the ticket sales date. And we even had Ticket Watch. Yep. Remember that, guys? Me and Ray did Ticket Watch. Because everybody knew they built up for a year to this big day of the tickets for Spider-Man No Way Home going on sale. No. Taylor Swift just said, oh, we got a movie. Tickets are on sale today. <laughs> just, maybe they need uh, Taylor Swift to uh, be the speaker for the WGA and the I mean, Actors. Maybe. Club. Don't yeah. submit to Taylor, maybe. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. This is like crazy stuff. And I have no idea how big this is going to be. I have no. <laughs> they got a month and a half to buy more tickets. Man, she's ruling the world right now. Uh, it is absolutely nuts. And hey, you know what? Hats off. Yep. Hats off. The little Frank Sinatra in there. I'm doing it my way. And uh, it's working. It's really working. She's going to be so stupid, Rich. Anyway, guys, <laughs> question is for you. What do you think about this? She's already destroying some box office records with ticket sales. Even Fandango is saying is in the neighborhood of Endgame and Star Wars The Force Awakens with no buildup to ticket launch day or anything like that. This is kind of ridiculous. Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, listen. With that down, guys, we're not going to go over and start taking some of our YouTube channel members' questions. We're going to get through as many as we can. But before we do, we're going to take another moment and thank another sponsor of today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast, our friends, my mobile service provider, and they should be yours, Mint Mobile. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video, Mint Mobile. Signing your life away to a big wireless provider is kind of like being trapped on a roller coaster from hell. Sure, it looks like fun at first. They probably even threw in a free phone, but now you can't get off. Month after month of insane bills and unexpected thrills, like overages and surprise fees. If that sounds like your current big wireless plan, it's time to get off the ride with Mint Mobile. For a limited time, wireless plans from Mint Mobile are just $15 a month. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for just 15 bucks a month. You guys know before I came to Mint Mobile, I was paying triple what I am paying now on the standard big wireless plan, and I will never go back. All plans come with unlimited talk, text, and high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with all your existing contacts. To get your new unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped right to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash campia. That's mintmobile.com dot com slash campia cut your wireless bill to just 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash campia and thank you to our friends at mint mobile for sponsoring this episode of the john campia show podcast all right guys with that down let's get over to our beloved channel members and hear what they have to say and what they want us to talk about so chris what do we got up here first from giggy hi all Ashamedly, after years of religious viewing, I've only just subscribed. <laughs> You're my go-to every day when I'm on my treadmill wishing I was doing something else. <laughs> Whilst watching the piece this week on The Highlander, I thought, this is also your favorite film, so why on earth are you not subscribing? So, here I am. Keep up the amazing work, the content, and the drive to keep things fresh and new. What's really Aww. strange is they're a member. But yeah, I, that's probably what yeah. he meant by subscribing. Probably oh, meant subscribing to membership. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate that. And like, yeah, I'm glad. I don't often come across people that find that say that The Highlander is also one of their favorite movies. Again, that's the one movie on my top ten list that when people hear it, they go, "Wait, what? That what? The one with Sean Connery? Yeah, yeah, one of my all time favorite movies. Can't wait for Henry Cavill to be the new Highlander. Very excited. All right, what's next? 
From Aaron, hey crew, here's something slightly interesting. Paul Rudd was the least famous of the entire cast of Friends back in the early 2000s. Yeah. But now Paul Rudd is the more famous one, and yet he's worth less than all of them. Here's Residuals, the thing. Baby. Uh, if you had a really, if you had a big show, this is the, it's the old model, yes, but the old model pay well. You had a show that could last more than three or four seasons. It would go into syndication and you would make money hand over fist if you were one of the few that got to be lucky enough to be in a show like that. Like the the, the cast of Seinfeld, they are all ridiculously wealthy. I loved hearing uh, Elaine, why am I freezing on her name? Dreyfus. Julie Louis Dreyfus. Julie Louise Dreyfus. She, she, I heard an interview where there, she goes, the reality is I'm embarrassingly wealthy. <laughs> and it's it's true. They make millions a year just from the residuals of Seinfeld. Um, and the Friends cast, probably more than anybody else, they are all stupid wealthy. Like, stupid wealthy. And I, again, and, and so you can understand, I think, when a lot of actors look at that, they, a lot of people say, well, of course, I want a piece of that too. Streaming is a different world. I, I, I don't know, but it's like, yeah, yeah, Paul Rudd is bigger than all of them. But he doesn't have probably one third of their net worth of those guys at all. All right, what's next? For Matt, hey crew, have any of you seen Ozark on Netflix? I've been watching it with my dad. We're on season three. It's so damn intense and makes you think, who can I really trust? It's crazy. I tried. Because <laughs> I, I really like Jason Bateman. Like a lot, my, my wife and I, Anne, we both love Jason Bateman. So we're like, we got to check this out. And I got about three episodes into it and I, I just tapped out. But everybody loves this show. Yep. Like Rob talks about it very, very passionately. Chris, I know, is Ozark one of the ones that you would watch? You have a friend on Ozark, don't you? Yeah, my, was it you that had a friend on yeah, Ozark? Yeah, my okay. friend Aaron is on an episode. She plays one of their teachers. Ah, yeah. okay. Not it, the Aaron who's on this show, Aaron Elizabeth Burns. Right. And yeah. so do you watch it, Ozark? No. Okay, so I'm not the only one <laughs> that doesn't watch friend. it. Okay. <laughs> She's very aware. <laughs> But it's one. Like, I hope you did great. It's won many awards, mm -hmm. and and it's got a huge audience, and people love it. I I, and, and I wanted to. It's just I got a couple episodes in. It just it wasn't clicking for me. I don't know why, but a lot of people love it. All right, what's next? From Doctor Stinky, hey John and crew, Rick and Morty season seven episode names are out, and they look awesome. I'm so excited for it. Rick and Morty's voices are going to be interesting. Rick and Morty is my favorite animated show ever. Are you guys hyped or excited? So I'm sorry to show. John I'm sorry to it. tell you, Doctor Stinky. <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, hey, Rick and Morty was a show I was late to, and a lot of my friends thought I would love it because it very much is my style of humor. And so I decided it was finally time for me to sit down and watch Rick and Morty. I watched the whole first season. I got to be honest with you. I don't think it's that good. Um. Uh, again, that's just me. I'm not poo-pooing on anybody that loves it because it's got a big audience. People really like it. Um, it's certainly very unique in in a space like that. Um, but it's it's really just not for me. I'll, I'll be honest. With you, I think Archer is by far the superior show. Uh, that's just me. My favorite all-time animated show only has one season. That's Arcane. Um, love, 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 love that show. Any of you guys watch Rick and Morty? No. I I do kind of just passively, like if it's on, I watch it. Logan's I mean, I, I'd it. probably like it. I just never got around to it. Yeah. So it's one of those things. Yeah. yeah I did the for whole first season. I did. I, I pushed through the entire first season. I'm just like, yeah, not really for me, uh, which is unfortunate because a lot, you know who loves Rick and Morty? Dennis. I, well, Dennis, Dennis is the one who got me to watch it. Yeah. You guys, of course, remember the Zen master, Dennis Zen, um, who I was just hanging out with him a little while ago. Uh, he he loves that show, but you know who else loves them? Apparently Kevin Feige, because he started hiring Rick and Morty writers left, right, and center to write a bunch of stuff that hasn't worked out so well. But anyway, there's that. All right, what's next? From CJ Rebirth. Hi, Chris. If you're here today, hi, I am. Another thing I love about voice acting in animation movie, animated movies is being surprised that a main character was voiced by X actress or actor they picked. Like, I had no idea that uh, Namari from Raya and the Last Dragon was voiced by the eternal Circe, Gemma Chan. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. And by the way, um, just because we don't mention enough around here, um, if you are somebody 
who is interested in voice acting and breaking into something like that, whether it's because you've got big career aspirations or just because it's something you really want to try, our very own Chris Carr is not only very experienced in this area, she teaches this. Yeah. And she's got her own business where she has, she teaches classes on this. It's called Speak Friend. Mm -hmm. Uh, just take a second, tell everybody about oh, Speak thanks. Friend. thanks. Yeah, uh, speakfriendstudios.com. Uh, I do a lot of the voiceover coaching. Logan does dialect work with people too. We actually have a new uh, dialect course coming out soon. Um, so if you want to do that, follow us either on Instagram, Speak Friend Studio, or go to our website, speakfriendstudio.com, and you can sign up. And I actually will have a intro to VO bootcamp in a while if you guys want to do that. Um, or you can sign on for one-on-one -on -one lessons. If finances are tight, I also do something called the Samwise Special, um, where it's like 20 bucks off because you're taking an early morning class because I'm a freak of nature and I wake up way too early. So you might as well hang out with me at 7 a.m. That's because you go to bed way too early. I knew, so I do. I go to, to bed that. at 9. I'm an old, old lady. <laughs> you know, it's I, embarrassing. I, I, By the way, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, Chris, isn't just doing this is doing this her resume and animation video game voiceover work i mean there's not much better you can do oh, than if you. you want to learn it's this a stuff. lot of commercials because every now and then someone's like chris carr what has she even done and i'm like i do commercials those don't go on imdb my guy but cool <laughs> yeah and a lot of commercials um, yeah thanks. all right with that down let's go on to the next thing what's our next question red one real talk hey crew did any of you end up finishing his dark materials the last season aired in the fall, and it was a sad farewell for what began as a promising beginning for Daphne Keen to carry the load of a show. The reveals in the last season and answers to the series mysteries just felt underwhelming. Not sure if it was the same in the books, though. Listen, Daphne Keen, James McAvoy, who I, I adore James McAvoy, uh, and obviously Daphne Keen with her work in Logan. And by the way, she's going to be in The Acolyte as well, yeah. the upcoming Star Wars show, The Acolyte. God, I wanted to like that. Ruth Wilson's in it. She's amazing. I didn't actively dislike it. Mm -hmm. uh, not at all. I watched the first two, three episodes. And then it was about three weeks later, I realized, oh, I haven't watched the next episode. But I don't feel really motivated to. Yeah. And I, I, yeah. Again, I'm, I'm not crap talking on it. If, if, if There are people out there who really like it, and that's great. Again, it's just one of those ones that, you know, wasn't for me. You know what I got to start watching though what everybody's telling me about? The new Taylor Sheridan uh, series, uh, Something Ops Lioness. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That is supposed to be, like our, my, the guy who manages our sponsorships and stuff like that, like he thinks it's the best thing on TV right now. So with Zoe Saldana, so I'm very, very keen on mm -hmm. watching that. Yeah. But, you know, and got back, we had to get caught up on Winning Time. Oh, how good was that episode? And it got caught up on what we do in the shadows. And then I got to get to Warrior. So I got to get Lioness, and then I got to get to Warrior. All right, what's next? From Jay Superboy. Hey, John, through all the seasons of Supernatural, which did you like best, episodes or the blooper reels? Me <laughs> personally, I can't decide from Fight the Fairies or Jensen Ackles lip syncing to Eye of the Tiger. Pitter patter. I've seen so many blooper reels from Supernatural. It's crazy. And you know, one of the, I think it's part of the thing that, made me so attached to it. Like I've always said about Supernatural, which ran 15 seasons, I believe, that there were better seasons, there were weaker seasons, but it never mattered to me because I just loved one hour a week hanging out with the boys, with the Winchesters. I just loved hanging out with them. And I think part of that was the fact that you knew these guys were actually like best friends in real life. Like they were, you know, I think the best men in each other's weddings and all this kind of stuff in their history. And you could feel that dynamic when they were on screen. And it just added to that feeling of loving to just watch along with them. So it's, it's really not about favorite episodes or favorite bloopers or whatever, but I've again, seen so many blooper reels that they've done. Uh, oh God, what's the actor who plays Crowley? I think it's strong, something strong. Mark Strong? And, Mark. Yeah. Wait, no, no, no. No, that's Mark not right. Strong's that's a different, a different guy. That's but a different one. But it is one. Mark something. Yeah. Shepard. I want to say Mark Shepard is his name. Check. I think it's Plays Crowley, one of my all-time favorite Shepherd, characters. Mark Shepard, yeah. One of my all-time favorite characters on television. There's some bloopers with him in it that are just awesome. Uh, but again, it was just, for me, it was just about hanging out with these characters on TV. I love doing it every week, and that's really my favorite part about it. All right, what's next? from james wheeler hello everyone i'm so excited next week i'm going to las vegas for the first time nice. in yeah. four years my wife's first time do you have any recommendations well Ooh. i'm i'm gonna be in vegas next weekend oh fine um Anne is uh gonna go see ed sheeran 
for the eighth time or something. Damn. Like that. Anne loves her ginger singer. She <laughs> loves Ed Sheeran. Um, and actually, what's actually I love Ed Sheeran too. What's not to love about that? He is a supremely gifted musician. He's just incredible. Um, so I'm tag. I'm not going to the concert, but I'm going to tag along. We got a couple of our other friends going with us as well. Um, as a touristy kind of person, I mean, for me, Vegas is about the restaurants. <laughs> I love the restaurants in Vegas so much. But walk the strip. Go in and see the the gardens in Bellagio. The gardens in Bellagio are beautiful. Just take a stroll around uh, Caesar's Palace. Um, I see the definitely take some time, hang out in front of the Bellagio, see the the fountain show. It's like amazing, uh, and then find some cool places to eat. I mean, then it's up to you. Do you, do you enjoy gambling? Obviously, there's a lot of great places to do gambling there. Or do you like seeing shows? There's a lot of shows going on in Vegas all the time. Obviously, Absinthe is a really celebrated show out there. See if you can see Absinthe. So, just go relax, have a good time. Don't set too much of a schedule for yourself and. Uh, and uh, remember, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Except right. chlamydia. Except like, chlamydia. Except chlamydia. That shit follows you back. Yeah. All right. What's next? From Dork of the Ninjas. Just wanted to say I got my podcast to work again. But also, how, oh, are, good. You, how are you liking Baldur's Gate 3, John? I absolutely love it so far. Just, you know, Dork of the Ninjas wrote in the other day saying, you know, uh, a couple of months ago, we switched podcast service providers because <laughs> we got like a thief in the night ripped off. Uh, long story, but we switched podcast providers and at, and everything was fine for people who subscribe to our podcast on Apple podcast on Spotify. But some people who use some of the smaller third party podcast apps said they weren't getting their show updated anymore. If you are one of those still, the answer is delete our podcast feed and then resubscribe to the podcast. feed. That does seem to fix everything. Uh, Baldur's gate three, I have not had a chance to play it in the last two days because any free minutes I've had, I've been wanting to spend with Anne because she was gone for a week in London. Uh, so I haven't played the last couple of days. But I, I, I'm getting shaky a little bit. I want to get back and play it because I'm like, hey, hey, hey. Um, I am loving Baldur's Gate 3. Listen, the promise of Baldur's Gate 3 was that you have never played a computer game that will feel like you're actually playing D Dungeons and Dragons. And I didn't expect it to be as good as it is. And when they tell you, you can do like anything in this game, brother, they weren't kidding. Like even main care. I told these guys, I, I ended up killing one of my main characters <laughs> and in any other game, it's like, well, your game's done. Cause this character is needed later on. But like the game just goes, okay, this character, which was going to be real vital in this one storyline, you got 500 other storylines you can go do. Obviously, you can't do those ones anymore, but now you can do these ones. And it's like, it's just incredible. How they made this game is absolutely beyond me. It's absolutely beyond me. If you haven't tried out Baldur's Gate, it's it's it, there's a learning curve to it. Yes, there is. But it's also intuitive at the same time. Give it a shot. I'm having a blast with it. All right, what's next? From Woodcut Art, my friend was telling me there was a camera guy and drone filming the Beyonce concert here in the Bay Area. I wouldn't be surprised if they come out with a documentary to show in theaters soon after. I haven't watched the Taylor and Beyonce concerts, but this is a good way to check it out with the fans. We'll watch it again. Chris, you said yourself, we were talking before the show started, and I think you were the one who said Beyonce can do this. Was, was that you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is what I was saying. I think I said this to Jonathan before you got here. There's a lot of people, myself, I brought this up, that you know maybe this could open up a new thing where if Taylor Swift's things is a big success, maybe others can do it. But I said, they're going to face the same dilemma that Mattel is going to face with the Barbie movie and Nintendo is facing with super Mario. Those movies are big hits. So everybody instantly thinks we'll now make movies out of all the Nintendo characters. Well, there's only one Mario. And if you think you can do Metroid and it's going to make a billion dollars, I think you were very wrong about that, but I want it. Well, sure. Yes. <laughs> but and make movies for me. What else is Mattel going to do a movie? Hot Wheels? Polly Pocket. Polly Mighty Pocket. Max. But none of those are Barbie. He man. Right? And the thing is, okay, big concert video works, but you're literally talking, honestly, about the biggest musical tour in the history of musical tours. And there's only really one Taylor Swift. I, 
Beyonce might be the other name. Beyonce might be the other name. And I was telling Jonathan, like maybe seven years ago, Coldplay could have been an option. Maybe 15 years ago, U2 could have been an option. But I, I just, what, what else? Drake, maybe? I, I mean, I I don't know. What other names could actually come anywhere club? Bad Bunny, maybe? Nope. Bad Bunny has a huge following. Yeah, so, but other than like two or three names. <laughs> no, no, just stop saying names. There's nothing. <laughs> That's gonna touch Taylor Swift. It's I, over. I was gonna say the I, passion of her followers. Taylor I'm sorry. She yeah, I don't just... know that this is an outlier more than a new mm-hmm. trend, but I don't know. Maybe maybe they can find a way to make it work. You know what? Maybe they could gauge it by the numbers of the actual tour and then decide like, oh, this is so big. Like, I mean, they were recording this before it even came to theaters, right? It was gonna be released on this, right? That's why they had the camera guy there at one of the concerts because it was probably gonna be like a home release of the tour right oh no no they they shot this planning to for they hired the, a director for it the whole bit yeah okay they just didn't it, let the rest it of the world seemed know. like they just said hey let's uh put this in the theaters like yesterday like they just planned it no yesterday. but it, it wasn't long before they started the tour that they, they actually put the plan in place oh. which by the way side note i don't know how i never saw this i was tr- thinking about the question about what other bands musical acts could could do something like this and i don't know why but i went down this rabbit hole i thought metallica but of course they did do something like yeah. something like that didn't work out nearly as well but i came across a video from two years ago and i don't know how i've never heard of it and i never saw it it was lady gaga singing with metallica and it was one of the coolest performances i've seen it was really good <laughs> So I, I, when we're done the show, I'm probably have to go back and finish. I was going to say that googling video. now. La, yeah, Metallica, Lady Gaga. The performance is incredible. Uh, all right, we I got time was good for what like... you sang with the Muppets. Shit. All right, <laughs> we got two more. What's next? From Alan, ha- uh, Happy Friday can't be a crew. I've been rewatching Modern Family. Nice. Phil Dunphy might be my favorite dad. He is so great. Do you guys have any favorite TV or movie dads? Have a great weekend. Uh, First of all, Modern Family is one of the sharpest written shows, comedy, uh, like ever. It's not my all-time favorite comedy, but the writing of that show never ceased to amaze me. It was always fantastic. And yeah, the the Phil character is so great. He is a great TV dad. Um, Man, there's a lot of all-time great dads, whether you're, you know, Mr. Keaton or whether you're- What's that? Yeah, Uncle you know, Phil. I just I Uncle just Phil? realized that Uncle, Uncle Phil one. voiced Shredder in in the TMNT old eighties cartoon. Really? Yeah, that's really. Uncle Phil Great job doing Shredder. How does one just realize that? Because <laughs> I never would have known that. Because something popped up on Instagram where it's like, uh, it, it showed all the actors doing right. the voices of TMNT. Oh, that's right. funny. And then I'm like, oh my god, Uncle Phil did Shredder. It's in that Turtle Power documentary. Uh, oh, that's yeah. awesome. I love knowing that. That's terrific. That's very cool. All right, one last one. What's next? From oh, Matt says hello. Hey, John and crew. Just to let you know that I can't watch Ahsoka without thinking about the amount of time she folds her arms. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's a lot of arm folding. You guys are going to realize that she's holding like 17 lightsabers under there. That's why they like, just keep falling. Maybe she's she's just like cold. the Groot of the Star Wars yeah. world. Maybe Ahsoka's <laughs> just cold. I mean, her, her robes are pretty thick, so maybe she's just maybe. always kind of chilly. I mean, yeah. that could be it. I So Anne watched the episode because she was behind the on the third one. She'd come back from London. And um, yeah, I don't know. What? It, what happened? What'd she say? She uh, was, you know, the best I'll, episode ever. I'll save that. I'll save that for later. She did comment about how short it felt. I mean, it was was pretty short. But I don't know. Maybe, yeah. You know, I've heard some things that maybe the the future ones are going to be a bit longer. We still got five episodes to go. Um, I am I am still the one thing that's starting to bother me. And who knows? Because maybe he'll pop up in episode four. But on Tuesday, we will at the end of Tuesday, we're going to be officially halfway through the series. All the marketing for this show has been thrown, 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 thrown. Heir to the Empire, Thrawn, showing the guy, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the next episode, we're going to be halfway through the series and we have not seen Thrawn yet. It's been like promising Thrawn, promising Thrawn. I don't want to have one of these Mandalorian end of season two where like, like, you know, Luke shows up in the last five minutes. I hope that's not what they're doing here. And maybe they're not. Maybe Thrawn shows up in episode four, which would be awesome. But you, you've been pretty heavy on the Thrawn stuff and we've not seen any Thrawn. I feel like... Dr. Ian and 
in Jurassic Park's like, uh, uh, hello, we, we are going to have some Thrawn. Uh, in this show that you've promised a bunch of Thrawn in at some point? I would yes? love for them to locate him and then the the ship just accidentally crashes into the other ship and they kill Thrawn right away. <laughs> <laughs> and then the credit and thus ended the career of Thrawn. Well, we know he's not going to die because apparently he's going to be the big bad guy in the Dave Filoni Star Wars movie. Oh. So yeah. we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll that see. One? Yeah. That, that uh, imaginary movie? Yeah. All right. Last question. Let's do one more. Sure. Uh, from Kevin. Bought the fi fiancé Taylor Swift movie tickets. Now she's planning on making an, a a, an outfit for when we see it. Oh, yeah. You have to have a, an elaborate outfit for I the I had Harris said, tour. like, much like the Barbie thing, people yeah. are going to be dressing up for this. They're going to oh, be dazzle everything. Yeah. It, I remember when I went to an early fan screening of the first Sex in the City movie so I could review it. I had never seen a, a Sex and City TV episode, but I went. I've never seen anything like it. It was 95% women in the theater, but they were all decked out. And in doing a quick survey, I went around, talked to, to a number of them, and like almost everybody I talked to specifically went out to buy new shoes to go to this movie in. Because I guess that's a big thing in Sex and the City, is shoes, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So... And then when you see the Barbie stuff, and before anybody starts criticizing the women who go to Barbie and dress up or go to these things and dress up, I've seen you in your fucking Incredible Hulk makeup, okay? <laughs> I've seen you dress up as Captain America looking ridiculous. I mean, I think it's awesome, but let's admit it. We We're look ridiculous. Like we do, right? your chest and tummies for sports. Yeah. Let, let, let's, let's not make fun of people then who go dress up for this. Let stuff. everyone have fun. You're going to see a no. lot of girls. You know what? That way, no. 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 Put it that way. No, I'm not letting anyone have fun anymore. <laughs> You're going to see a lot of girls dressed. This is going to be an event. I'm going to be one of them. And Ray pointed out, probably as a sub-business, nobody's going to make more money out of this Eras tour as a sub-business than uh, AMC's MacGuffins. That's mm -hmm. the name of the bar yeah. in the yeah. AMC theaters. Yeah. Well, we're gonna well they're going to have... We're going to have all ages of... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, for so. sure. And they're going to have their... And they're their, all going to be drinking. Their custom, like, swift drinks or whatever, you know? Yeah. Because they make drinks for their different movies that yep. they do. Yes, they do. And guys, that'll do it for today's installment of the John Campy Show podcast. Thank you so much for being here and making this show part of your day. Big special thank you to our YouTube channel members. Number one, just for being channel members and being supportive of what we do, but also for submitting those topics and giving us some fun things to talk about. I want to thank everybody in the room with me. Ray Ora. Yep, see you. Jonathan Voiko. Later. Chris Carr is going to be hosting Open Mic a little bit later this yeah, afternoon. come hang out. And to all of you guys, thanks so much for being here. My name's John Campia, and until next time, my friends, bye-bye.